Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and the services can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. The Society Foundation uh, support, their financial support, allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. We have a real treat today. Our speaker is Jeff Barnes. Jeff is a freelance writer and fifth generation Nebraskan, a former newspaper reporter and editor, past chairman of the Nebraska Hall of Fame Commission and former marketing director for the Durham Western Heritage Museum in Omaha. He's traveled more than 13,000 miles in researching and photographing forts of the Northern Plains, which is his first book. His topic today is the forts of Nebraska. Please welcome Jeff Barnes. Thank you, John, very much. I, I, I'm very excited to be here. For I, I guess if I were an opera singer, the equivalent of this would be performing at the Met. So to be in the <laughs> to be in the seat of Nebraska history is uh, is really kind of neat. Uh, if you if you do have a cell phone, I'd appreciate it if you turned it off. Um, I don't have notes, so I can't just pick up or leave off. If I I go by memory, and if I get about 40 minutes into the program and the cell phone goes off. I have to restart from the beginning, so <laughs> I don't want to keep you <laughs> too long over your lunch hour here. But uh, no, as I said, this is this is very very exciting to be here today. Uh, big fan of Nebraska history, having been you know as I said uh, from great great grandfathers having come to Nebraska and a family been in Nebraska for I guess since about the 1880s and uh, just <laughs> love the state and uh, to be here is just just fantastic. Uh, forts of Nebraska, i, I got to admit to being kind of a homer when it comes to the forts of our state as well. Uh, we take the lead in a, in a good number of areas of the, uh, of the forts of the Great Plains and having a, one of the first forts, one of the largest forts in terms of events that happened here. Uh, the personalities that came through is just a just a really exciting place to be if you're interested in the forts of the, um, of the Plains Indian Wars. Now, when we talk about our forts, uh, we actually go back to more than 200 years ago when Lewis and Clark first came to the area. And this is a woodcut of their meeting with the Otone Indian uh, tribes on the uh, location just north of Omaha on a site which Clark called the, uh, the Council Bluff. And it's from his termina termination of terminology of that as the Council Bluff that we have a Council Bluffs, Iowa today. This, the entire region was known as the Council Bluffs because of what Clark had written. But he had also noted in his journal that it would make an excellent site for a fort or a trading post of some kind. Now that didn't come to pass for another 15 years when the United States decided that it did need forts along the Missouri River, and this will help you somewhat in determining the boundary stuff today. Uh, they decided, you know, with the, um, with the British Canadians uh, and their longstanding relationship with the tribes of the Northern Plains, they were not recognizing that this was now American territory. So they thought if we have a chain of forts along the Missouri River, that will help keep them out. The river is essentially the interstate highway of the day. All the commerce went up and down the Missouri, and that's why they said we need to have forts here. Uh, sometimes called Fort Calhoun, sometimes called Fort Council Bluff. Uh, officially, it was designated as uh, Fort Atkinson by the War Department. Uh, Colonel Henry Atkinson was the, was the leader of the uh, contingent which built that, built that fort. And uh, they came up river with about 1,000 soldiers to do this. In the midst of uh, establishing that first post, Congress cut the funding for the project. That sometimes happens with the military in Congress. But uh, this is as far as they got. And instead of bringing the soldiers back home, or at least back to, uh, to St. Louis and Jefferson Barracks, they kept them there here in Nebraska. And as a result of that, Fort Atkinson became the largest fort in America at the time. With nearly 1,000 soldiers, that represented a fourth of America's standing army. Uh, here in Nebraska, <laughs> unbelievably. Uh, it was, of course, the furthest, furthest west post in the country at the time. This was the very, very edge of the frontier. And, you know, just a few years before that had been termed as the Great American Desert. Well, being a, being a couple months out of St. Louis, they realized very quickly that they had to su 
rely on themselves for sustenance, and most of these soldiers were, were farm boys, and so they immediately began proving that this was not the great American desert, that it was a very productive land. Uh, they began planting corn, they had hay, wheat, they had their own dairy, their own flour mill. Uh, they also established what was the first school in Nebraska, the first library, uh, conducted the first church services in the state. So this was a very, very happening place on the Great Plains. Uh, a lot of personalities came through here. And this, of course, they did uh, business with the trappers and traders and the Indian tribes of the region. Uh, a couple of those people that came through here were Jim Bridger and Jim Beckworth. They weren't well known at the time, but very early in their scouting and ex exploration careers, and trapping careers, they came through Fort Atkinson. Uh, this is also where a lot of America's future military leaders got their training, including Albert Sidney Johnston, who was a lieutenant at the time. Uh, he went on to become a general in the United States Army until the uh, Civil War broke out, and uh, he, he, being from Texas, switched his allegiances. And what by many was considered to be the, um, the person that was going to the general that was going to lead the Confederacy in the Civil War until his untimely death at the Battle of Shiloh. And another lieutenant at Fort Atkinson was Stephen Kearney, and his name, of course, goes on to become very famous, uh, very well known in, in Nebraska, and talk a little bit more about that uh, in, uh, following up here. This, of course, was a military post, uh, and uh, even though it was that, there was only one military action that actually took place out of Fort Atkinson, and that was the so-called Arikara War of 1823. What set this off a group of American traders uh, had been attacked and 10 members of their party killed by Arikara Indians on the upper Missouri River. The surviving members of that group came down to Fort Atkinson and demanded that its commander, Colonel Henry Leavenworth, do something about it. Uh, Fort Atkinson was there to promote the friendly trade with the Indians, and if Indians are attacking and killing traders, that is not friendly. So they wanted the power of the United States government behind them. And Leavenworth obliged. Uh, he, he led uh, about 100 soldiers up the river. Along the way, they ran into a, um, a group of about 400 Sioux who hated the Arikara. And if there's a chance to mix it up with them, they wanted to take advantage of that. <laughs> so they set up camp across the, across the river from the Arikara village. A uh, couple days of heated words between the two groups, which culminated in the uh, Americans lobbing a couple cannon shells into the village, uh, destroying a few of the lodges, killing a few uh, members of the tribe, and sending the rest of it running to the hills in the background that you see there. And that ended the Arikara War of 1823. <laughs> very, it wasn't even a, it was barely a skirmish by uh, war terminology, but it was the very first armed conflict between United States soldiers and uh, the Plains Indians. The very first of the Plains Indian Wars uh, took place out of Fort Atkinson. Uh, in the long run, it, or in, even in the short run, it really didn't make that big a difference. Uh, the United States was no longer interested in the fur trade, which prompted the creation of Fort Atkinson. Uh, the beaver pelt market had collapsed, and by 1826, the United States said, we no longer need Fort Atkinson. It was ordered decommissioned that year, and in uh, 1827, the flag was lowered for the last time. Uh, the 6th Infantry, which is depicted here up at Fort Atkinson State Historical Park, uh, the 6th Infantry returned to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, came back up the Missouri that same year to establish a new post at the head of the Santa Fe Trail, which they named after their commander, Fort Leavenworth. So today's Fort Leavenworth is actually the son of Fort Atkinson in Nebraska. And we went for oh, about 20 years without a, without a fort in the state. And what happened to change that was what was known as the Great Migration. Uh, the Mormons, of course, had come across Nebraska, escaping from persecution to, to settle in the Great Salt Lake River, uh, Great Salt Lake area. Uh, the um, Oregon Territory had been opened up for settlement in the 1840s, bringing hundreds and thousands of more uh, immigrants across the Great Plains. And then gold was discovered in California in 1849. So what started out as a, as a trickle in the mid, uh, early mid 1840s, I'm going to get over that thing. It started out as a trickle, uh, eventually became a flood. This was the largest peacetime immigration in the world's history. You know, usually you have this many people moving because of war, pestilence, whatever. But to have this many people moving under peaceful circumstances just to find a better life for themselves or just to try to find some, some wealth somewhere or something like that had never been seen before in, in, the, in the world. And uh, the United States knew that uh, with this many people coming through there, they needed some kind of fort, of some kind to, uh, to offer some protection on the Great Plains uh, and offer maybe some guidance, repairs when needed, that sort of thing. 
And this is Nebraska, what became the, what will become Nebraska eventually. There's the outline of the state today. And you had everybody taking the Platte River Valley. This is, uh, this is the natural uh, interstate highway across country, across the continent, uh, had been opened up by um, Stephen Kearney as a colonel, uh, demonstrating the power of the United States by firing a cannon a couple times to, uh, <laughs> to demonstrate to the Indians. And they allowed for the peaceful uh, transfer across there then. Uh, the thinking was that, uh, that the new emigrations were going to be coming across in the southeast corner of what is now Nebraska. This was a site uh, uh, selected by Colonel Kearney back in the 1830s. It was a flat land uh, adjacent to the Missouri and thought this would be a natural crossing for people uh, coming across the Missouri River. And this is uh, the first and probably only depiction of what was called Fort Kearney, uh, built in what is now uh, Nebraska City. They began construction in 1846, got interrupted by the Mexican War. Uh, the soldiers went south to fight in that war. When they came back to the, uh, to the site to finish the construction of the fort, they found out that emigrants were not going to be coming this direction. Uh, for one thing, you had the Mormons who were crossing uh, the Missouri up around the Omaha Council Bluffs Florence area. And then you also had the Oregon Trail and the California Trail coming up from Independence, Missouri across Kansas and linking up with the Platte River there. So to, to alter this, they knew they needed a new fort to take uh, the place of Fort Kearney. Uh, a, a group led by um, Lieutenant Daniel Woodbury uh, took off west for the Platte River, about 180 miles directly west of Fort Kearney. He found a new site at the south end of the Grand Island of the Platte River. Uh, they constructed a new post, which was named Fort Childs. Uh, Woodbury named, uh, named the post Fort Childs after a hero of the Mexican War who also just happened to be his father-in-law. And uh, I, I guess if you have the opportunity to keep your wife happy and you can do that by naming a fort after her dad, then I guess that's the sort of thing you did back then. <laughs> so the, the, the soldiers at Fort Kearney moved west to Fort Childs. Fort Kearney was abandoned and uh, became the nucleus of what is now today Nebraska City. Uh, it operated as Fort Childs for his first year until the, uh, until the death of Stephen Kearney in 1848. And at that point, the fort got a new name. The War Department thought it should be named after one of their, one of their great generals. And that became the new Fort Kearney. And Old Fort Kearney was known as Old Fort Kearney in the dispatches. Now, this is a painting of the, um, of the post by um, William uh, Henry Jackson. There's Fort Kearney over to the right here. And you can see the soldiers, the cavalry there on horseback and the flag. Uh, Jackson really did Fort Kearney a favor with this painting. It did not look nearly as nice as, as what it's depicted here. Uh, but, you know, for, for immigrants coming across the Great Plains, bouncing along in wagons for weeks upon weeks upon weeks, when, when they got to the site, many of those who kept a journal uh, depicted it as a castle, <laughs> a shining castle on the Great Plains. Uh, as I said, it did not, did not look better than this. But for those who hadn't seen civilization for a long, long time, it looked pretty good. Uh, interesting thing about this painting, of course, with the buffalo stampede across the Platte River Valley here, uh, these stampedes would go on for hours and, you know, better part of the day sometime. And I always point that out to people, you know, you start complaining when you're at a railroad crossing and it's been five minutes and you're still not moving. These people waited a long, long time. And then, of course, when they... Buffalo had finished crossing it, buffaloes always leave souvenirs behind and you got to take your wagons through that. Uh, the other interesting thing about the painting here, uh, you of course see the, uh, the dust trails being kicked up on the, uh, the north side of the channel there. Uh, those were Mormons. They preferred to stick to the north side of the Platte River and not travel with the Gentiles, which anybody that wasn't a Mormon was called a Gentile. Uh, they did bring uh, riders across the river to check and see if there was mail waiting for, uh, for uh, some of the Mormons and also the leave mail. Uh, the forts did that back then. That's where you transferred uh, uh, mail and other communications that you wanted to share. Um, among some of the names that passed through here, of course, there's, uh, there's Mark Twain back when he was Samuel Clemens and Wild Bill Hickok before he was completely wild, uh, came, through, came through Fort Kearney. I, I hate to single them out because virtually everybody that was coming west came through Fort Kearney. It was just the landmark on, uh, in the, on the Great Plains. That was one of the sites that you were looking forward to seeing. That's, that's where you got your information, what lie ahead. Uh, it was just a fantastic place 
in the in the minds of the uh, of the cross country immigrants, and it was that way for uh, at least fifteen years. Uh, that was the fort on the Great Plains that uh, that uh, pretty much uh, supervised the area. And that brings us up to the period of the Civil War. Uh, Civil War, of course, being fought mostly in the eastern part of the country, but there was a great deal going on on the Great Plains because of the Civil War as well. Uh, we had the, um, the Dakota Uprising in Minnesota. See, one thing that led to these things as well, um, the regular troops that were stationed at the forts on the Great Plains, they got sent back east to fight in the Civil War. Uh, they were trained soldiers. They were accustomed to um, the Plains Indian culture. Uh, they knew a lot more than the, than the volunteers that took their places, and they had a lot more training than the volunteers that took their place. So the problems that uh, led to the Dakota Uprising in 1862, that spilled over into the Dakotas. Then you also had the Sand Creek Massacre in 1864 in Colorado. The problems that resulted from that spilled over into the Nebraska Territory, and that left the volunteer soldiers that were there to fight them, and it created a great amount of problem for, for Nebraska. We were, saw almost as much uh, warfare in our state or our territory at the time that, that was seen back east. Uh, of course, Fort Kearney being uh, the predominant fort on the, on the plains, uh, this was also the site, Fort Laramie was in the Nebraska Territory at the time. And these were the only two forts on the trails coming across the state. Great amount of territory for two forts to cover, and that led to the establishment of the next two forts I'm going to talk about, Fort Mitchell and Fort McPherson. But also, about every 10 miles along the trail, there were also smaller camps, posts, and stations established just to keep the traffic moving. And there's a good number of times that traffic was completely stopped because of the warfare. Uh, I did bring along a map that does show the location of some of those much smaller posts, but uh, the, mo the main ones that I'm going to talk about are Fort McPherson and Fort Mitchell. Now, as you can see from this uh, photograph of Fort McPherson, in the foreground here, we have stables, and you see a herd of horses there. This was a cavalry post. They had five cavalry companies there, uh, and that was because just the situation they were up against. The Sioux and the Cheyenne and the Arapaho were some of the best light horsemen in the world. Uh, they could strike fast. They could move fast, disengage fast. They covered a lot of ground, and they did it very quickly. Uh, the only way to fight at the time was on horseback yourself. Uh, the soldiers did as well as they could under the circumstances. They weren't nearly as good as what the, uh, what the Sioux and the Cheyenne were. But uh, in terms of combating that and keeping the trail open, that's what it had to be. Uh, and Fort McPherson continued uh, that throughout the, the Civil War. Uh, one interesting little side note to, in the history of Fort McPherson, and it didn't really originate out of here, but uh, the, uh, the Great Buffalo Hunt of 1872, when the, uh, the Grand Duke Alexis of Russia was visiting the United States, he had in, in mind that he wanted to take one of these great buffalo hunts that he heard about, and that's the Grand Duke right there with his, uh, it kind of looks like a dachshund, I don't, I don't know what exactly it is. And uh, the United States was great friends with Russia at the time, and they said, absolutely, we want, uh, we want the Grand Duke happy. And uh, so they set up a buffalo hunt, and uh, along the trip they brought uh, General George Custer. Oops, that's what happens when I get. <laughs> brought him along, as well as uh, Buffalo Bill Cody as a guide to find the buffalo for them. And uh, uh, the Brule Sioux Chief Spotted Tail uh, was talked into uh, doing some uh, performing for the, uh, for the party as well. Now we've got an expert in the house that knows far, far more about this than I do, and he's helping me for part of the next book, and so I don't want to say too much because I don't know nearly as much as what he does about this. Um, but this, I would love to have been a part of this, this hunting expedition. I'm not a hunter myself, but uh, to be around personalities like Custer, and I, I know he could tell stories about himself that would put you to sleep after about four <laughs> hours, but, but to have Cody there and just, just the, just the the party, the entire party involved. I would love to have been a part of that. Uh, fort Mitchell was the other fort set up on the trail as well. This was actually uh, officially called Camp Schumann. It was a subpost of Fort Laramie, and this is out by Scott's Bluff on the west side of the bluff. You can see in the background there. A very small post, uh, never more than 60 soldiers there altogether in cavalry, and they tried to perform what, uh, what McPherson did on a smaller scale. Uh, they participated in the provide some relief to the Battle of Mud Springs. And um, I knew I was going to do this. Doug, what was the other small battle that they were? Rush Creek. That's right, Rush Creek. Uh, they participated in that. But uh, unlike many of the other forts, uh, this was built out of adobe. 
uh, you built, you generally built what, what materials you had on hand. Fort Atkinson was built of timber. Uh, Fort Kearney was largely built of sod. Uh, Fort Mitchell was built of adobe, which is a mixture of sand and mud and, and water, because that's what they had on hand. Uh, uh, plenty of that, and of course you had to patch it up every time it rained or the windstorm took it, <laughs> took it apart a bit, but uh, it, it served the, the functions for Fort Mitchell. Uh, among the people that came through here was William Henry Jackson. This is his painting, uh, derived from a sketch he made when he was a younger man passing through here. Uh, he went on to become one of the great photographers of the world. Uh, before um, and in his retirement, he went back to his sketches and repainted them uh, in his later life, and this is, this is one of them. Of course, Brigham Young came through here uh, escorting um, uh, Mormon immigrants through the, through the North Platte River Valley there. Uh, after the Civil War came a new period for the for the forts of Nebraska, and uh, this was in the uh, in the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. There was always a fear during the Civil War that the West Coast could break off from the East Coast. A uh, great amount of uh, distance between both coasts there, and people like to have their government if at arm's length anyway, uh, but certainly don't want to have the government 3,000 miles away. And so they knew, the government knew after the war that they had to bind the coast together, and the best way to do that was the Transcontinental Railroad. And this is a photograph taken out close to what's uh, COZED uh, today. This is the 100th Meridian, uh, marking 247 miles from Omaha. And uh, 100th Meridian is generally given as this is where the west begins. This is where the air becomes drier. The terrain starts to really, really rise towards the mountains. And this is a, this is a very um, significant point for them. Uh, as I said, the makeup of the forts changed somewhat because of this as well. Fort Kearney and Fort McPherson were still around, but uh, we also got three new posts in this time as well. And the first ones I want to talk about were located in Omaha. Uh, Omaha Barracks I'll talk about right after this, but I want to start with the government corral, which was also known as uh, the Omaha Quartermaster Depot. Uh, for, the, for the forts, this was sort of their, their Sam's Club or... Well, I guess you'd call it Uncle Sam's Club. This is, this is where they got their horses, their mules, their saddles, blankets, ammunition, food stuff, uh, weapons. Everything that was needed at the post came through the government corral. Uh, came, usually came up river, up the Missouri, uh, loaded onto wagons and taken over to the, to the warehouses here where it was sorted out and loaded onto rail cars and shipped out west. This was big, big business for Omaha. Uh, we also had the Department of the Platte headquartered here. Uh, this was the Department of the Platte was a military district which covered all of Nebraska, Iowa, Wyoming, Utah, even parts of Idaho. Uh, this is where the contracts were signed and uh, negotiations were made, all taking place out of here. And the, uh, the storekeeper for the corral said there were more generals, colonels, majors, and captains walking the streets of Omaha then than there were police officers. It was just such a big military town at the time. And... Uh, that went on for about eight years altogether until the government decided that it wanted to move the corral either to Chicago to be closer to the divisional headquarters or else out to Cheyenne to be closer to the forts themselves. And this set what's become a long-standing tradition in Omaha since then. If there's a threat of losing a major government installation or a major government contract, the city's going to bend over backwards and make sure that that doesn't happen. And uh, this is where we get into a little... Uh, Probably a little bit of shady things going on, but it did keep the corral here. Uh, they originally moved it to a site, moved it out of downtown Omaha since it had been surrounded by the city, uh, moved it to a site up, um, up by Omaha Barracks. That didn't work out for a number of reasons. And then they eventually moved to a site south of downtown. Oh, before I, before I leave here, um, this is the UP yards right here. This is the site of the Quest Center today. And the government corral is located, it used to be parking lot E for the Quest Center, but uh, next year I think it's going to be the right field of the new baseball stadium. That's, that'll be the site of the corral then. But they did get a final site selected for the corral. This was further down the UP line, and this became the new Omaha Quartermaster Depot. And uh, this is one of the beautiful uh, warehouse buildings that was constructed in 1880. And uh, the buildings are still there today, but it served the posts uh, that served the forts throughout the, the Plains Indian Wars on up until World War I and II. Uh, and I found out that uh, it's still 
still active today. It was, was supposed to have been shut down uh, back in November, but it's still, still active today as a, as a reserve post. Uh, Omaha Barracks, uh, initially it was called Sherman Barracks. Uh, General Sherman ordered its construction. The Army had lost the Red Cloud War in Wyoming. Uh, the Bozeman Trail had been shut down and the three forts that were along the trail were closed as a result, but Sherman still wanted to be, have a presence there. What he was thinking was that we'll keep the soldiers in Omaha, uh, lodge them in Omaha, and as they're needed, send them out on the, on the Union Pacific Line to reach the forts, or to reach the, uh, the sites where the, the conflict was and where they were needed. It had a very quiet existence for the first six years, the first eight years of its life, until the Army in um, the decisions that they sometimes make without having a real reason behind them, uh, the Army decided that all department headquarters had to be located at a fort. Well, there wasn't a fort in Omaha. Uh, they said, well, we've got Omaha Barracks. What if we call that Fort Omaha? And so just overnight, the barracks became a fort. Uh, the commanding officer, uh, the com commander of the District of the Platte, he had to move to the new Fort Omaha as well. They had to build a new headquarters for the Department of the Platte to house all of the generals and colonels and majors and captains that were needed to conduct the business of the Army on the Plains. And uh, that turned Omaha Barracks from one of the most insignificant posts on the Plains to one of the most important points on the Plains uh, because uh, of uh, General Crook's uh, standing with the Army at the time and his, his friendship. Uh, President Grant paid a call on him uh, here in Omaha. That made it very important for high society in Omaha to visit Fort, Fort Omaha. Uh, of course, you want to meet the president when he's in town, and so that, that brought them up to the post. This is, this is about four miles from, from downtown Omaha, by the way. Uh, this is also where Standing Bear was lodged during his trial, uh, which ultimately established that uh, the American Indian was a citizen under United States law. So it had a very important position in, in American history as well. But uh, General Crook, of course, realized that this was not practical for the business of, uh, of the military to be positioned at Fort Omaha. The contracts that they were signing were, were done with businesses in downtown. And uh, it wasn't practical to saddle up every day to make a four mile jaunt into town to sign a contract. It wasn't practical for the, uh, for the contractors in downtown Omaha to come up to the fort every day. Crook eventually succeeded in getting the department headquarters moved back to downtown. And um, his, his lodging also went, moved from, down, from the fort back to downtown as well to an apartment down there. Uh, the headquarters building at that point became, uh, became a hospital for the post. And eventually Fort Omaha, uh, getting into the 1890s, the Plains Indian Wars being, being ended, uh, the Army ultimately ordered its uh, decommissioning in 1895, and that's General Crook's house right there. But we're not quite done with Fort Omaha, and I'll come back to that. The other post I want to talk about on the, uh, on the railroad was Fort Sydney. This is a photograph, uh, I think, from the late 1870s, in 1880s, but uh, what I want to talk about now is shown better with a map. And you might think of this kind of like as a weather map too, when you, they talk about a perfect storm and about uh, you know hurricanes and tornadoes, cells developing, that sort of thing. That's kind of what you'll see in this map of, of Fort Sydney. Now, Fort Sydney started out as Sydney Barracks. It was a subpost of Fort Sedgwick in Colorado. And that's the buildings of the, of the barracks right there. And this is the military reservation located there. Uh, Sydney Barracks was, was put there to guard the uh, Union Pacific as it made its way across the continent. And that's the Union Pacific line coming through there. And the town of Sydney was established as a railhead uh, for, the, for the supply of the, uh, of the rail coming through. Soldiers uh, eventually get paid. And when they do get paid, uh, a lot of them like to spend their money on gambling and on drinking and on women. Same thing with railroad workers. When they do get paid, they like to have uh, see some uh, see some uh, card playing and some some whiskey and some women. And people in Sydney were more than happy <laughs> to take the money from those soldiers and rail workers and provide them gambling, uh, drinking, and women. Sydney, you see how big the town of Sydney is right here. It had 89 saloons. <laughs> had 23 of them in one block. Gunfights were regular, uh, regular occurrences, almost daily occurrences in Sydney. Uh, many, many lynchings, and some of them were actually legal. 
a good number of burials at the Boot Hill Cemetery north of town. Uh, most of those were after midnight because there's not too many people around to ask questions when you're burying people after midnight. <laughs> they tell the so story of a soldier who was uh, at, a, at a dance at a roadhouse, somehow shot himself in the middle of the dance floor. They didn't end the dance. They just picked him up by the shoulders and dragged him back to a corner so they could keep dancing. And a couple more bodies joined his later on in the night before it was all over. <laughs> This was just a wild and crazy town. You had gunfighters, you had gamblers, you had ladies of the evening, you had pioneers coming through, you had gold prospectors coming through. Every stereotypical personality of the Old West made their way to Sydney at one point or the other. Uh, just a wild, crazy, fun-loving town. Uh, Buffalo Bill Cody was said to have loved it here. <laughs> Spent a lot of time in, in Sydney. Uh, but he also made it to the other side of the tracks. Uh, you can find his initials carved into a pew in one of Sydney's churches today. Uh, another frequenter of uh, Sydney was Jane Canary, better known as Calamity Jane. She got pregnant by one of the soldiers while she was visiting the town and, uh, and uh, gave, the, gave the baby up for adoption almost immediately. It's, it's said that she loved men but hated children. <laughs> uh, one of the forces for good at Sydney Barracks at the hospital was a young um, Army captain named Walter Reed. He was a surgeon at the post. This was his second post in Nebraska. He had served at the hospital at Fort Omaha and went on to serve at Fort, um, uh, Fort Robinson before he left the state. Uh, and eventually, of course, he went on to the, uh, the Panama Canal during its construction and helped find a cure for yellow fever, which is why we have a Walter Reed Army Hospital in uh, outside Washington, D.C. today. And I like to think it's because of that good Nebraska training that he got while he was in the state. Uh, then we come to a period, which I call the period of the police forts. Um, this is a map of Nebraska in 1879. Uh, the state has been a state for 12 years at this point, but there's still a good section of, the, of Nebraska that does not have counties, does not have section lines, does not have settlements. Uh, Everything was still pretty much going on in the east and along the trail there, along the rail. But this is still largely a wild and woolly state. Uh, of course, the Sioux were still pretty much occupying the, the, the sand hills. Good number of, um, of um, horse thieves, robbers, that sort of person, personalities out there. And the forts that were built during this per period were somewhat built for the Plains Indian Wars, but also helped to keep, keep the whites and the, and the Indians apart as well. Uh, first one of those was Fort Robinson, which started out as Camp Robinson, uh, built mostly for the um, security of the, of the agency, the Indian agency, Red Cloud Agency, uh, built uh, uh, prior to the post's establishment there. Uh, of course, as far as personalities, Red Cloud was here. Uh, Dull Knife was, uh, was at, the, uh, at the post uh, during the, the, the tragic uh, Cheyenne outbreak. Uh, of course, one of the best known names of, of, as far as the Indian chiefs of the, of the Great Plains was Crazy Horse. This is where he was arrested and ultimately uh, killed in, in attempting his arrest at, at the fort. Uh, another one of these uh, posts was Fort Hartsuf, uh, located in the North Loop Valley. It was built primarily to fill the vacuum created with the closing of Fort Kearney. As I said, there were still Sioux in the area. White settlement was coming into the North Loop Valley. And we also had the Pawnee Reservation still in Nebraska at that time to the east of the, of the river. And the Sioux, of course, did not get along with the Pawnee. And uh, so Fort Hartsuff was established somewhat in the, uh, in the protection of that. A uh, very, very small post, never more than 55 soldiers located at Fort Hartsuff. Uh, had a relatively short life, but in terms of military actions, it had one of the I guess, biggest military actions in the, in the state's history, and that was the Battle of the Blowout. Uh, this took place a couple months before the Battle of the Little Bighorn. This was in April of 1876, and this is a depiction of it, which a uh, painting which is out at Fort Hartsuff. But uh, only about a dozen soldiers involved in this altogether. Uh, one fatality, uh, a Sergeant Doherty, I think that's probably him there coming over, over the, the lip of the blowout to see if the Indians were in the... Uh, in the blowout, and they were, and he was immediately <laughs> went out. But uh, three um, medals of honor were awarded uh, from this battle. Uh, Percentage-wise, it's probably one of the greatest instances <laughs> of, of medals of honor being, being uh, awarded in an engagement. Uh, Fort Niobrara took over the role of Fort Hartsuff eventually. Hartsuff was closed in 1881, and, and Niobrara did take its place. 
Uh, Fort Niobrara is unique in that it is one of the few posts named for a body of water. That's the Niobrara River in the, in the foreground here. And it was actually a fairly large post. They had about 90 buildings all, all together, uh, built just outside of what is now Valentine, Nebraska, uh, built to keep the Sioux on their reservations in, in South Dakota, but also to keep the whites out of the reservation as well. Uh, fairly quiet existence that it had. Uh, two military personalities of note came through Niobrara, uh, one being Frederick Benteen. Uh, he was one of the survivors, uh, one of the surviving commanders of the engagement up at Little Bighorn, uh, separate from Last Stand Hill, of course. But uh, this was the end of his career. Uh, he had reported for duty in 1881, and um, I think the next day uh, went uh, put in for, um, they don't call it sick leave, do they? When you're, when you're sent to the, what's, what's the equivalent of the hospital? I'm having a mind blank here. Consequently, <laughs> okay. And after about a month of that, applied for and got a medical discharge. And so kind of an inglorious end to a career that was uh, fairly pockmarked as well. A uh, young lieutenant that was at uh, Fort Niobrara was uh, John J. Pershing. Uh, he, held a, he was at a number of posts on the Great Plains, and I don't think Niobrara is where he picked up the nickname that he uh, had for the rest of his life. And uh, I always thought this came from a, um, from a poker game, but it was actually the result of uh, having commanded the, uh, uh, the company of the 10th, uh, 10th Cavalry, the, uh, the African-American uh, Cavalry of the, of the Great Plains. Uh, fellow officers thought it would be funny to start calling him Black Jack Pershing because of, of that association. And, and that was a name that stuck with him for the rest of his career. I don't know if he, if he enjoyed that nickname particularly. He, uh, of course, he went on to become uh, general of the armies, a post that no one had held since George Washington. And so if he didn't, didn't like that nickname, I'm sure he took care of anybody that gave him that nickname. <laughs> and then we come to our last post, which I call the uh, political fort. Uh, fort Crook was built to replace Fort Omaha. And as I mentioned, Fort Omaha was decommissioned in 1895. Uh, Omaha was always too small for the Army's needs. It was only about 40 acres and didn't have the land that the Army needed for its purposes. But we really didn't need Fort Crook as, at the time either. But I, I told you about the Omaha tradition. If there's a threat of losing a government installation or contracts, they're going to do what they can to keep it from happening. And this is where maybe a little bit of greed got involved. And, uh, and uh, Fort Crook was, was built. Uh, 1894. It was originally to be called Fort Omaha since it was taking the place of that fort, but with uh, General Crook's passing, uh, decided it should be named in his honor. Uh, the Plains Indian Wars were over, of course. There were no battles to be fought, and so for the first four years of its existence, uh, the soldiers of the 22nd Infantry drilled and drilled and drilled on the uh, parade grounds of the fort, and that's Officer's Row in the background there. Uh, what happened to change that came in 1898 um, was, was a war, not in Nebraska, not even in the United States, but uh, an international war, uh, the Spanish-American War. Uh, the USS Maine had, had blown up in Havana Harbor, and the 22nd Infantry stationed at Fort Crook became the very first American troops to hit the beach in Cuba. Uh, kind of an ironic situation for, for troops uh, stationed in Nebraska to become... Uh, become the first troops to hit the beach in Cuba, but that's, that's what had happened. Uh, during World War I, Fort Crook served as a balloon school, along with uh, Fort Omaha, which I'll talk about again a little bit. Uh, its next exposure to aviation came in the 1920s, early 1920s, when the Army Air Corps decided that it needed a base uh, airfield at, uh, at Fort Crook. There's a parade ground there, and that's uh, the enlisted men's barracks and officer's rope. And here's the new airfield right there, and you can make out a couple biplanes on both sides of the airstrip there, and there's the hangar and the light tower there. Didn't have a name initially. A couple years after its uh, creation, however, uh, decided that it should be named after one of the um, sons of a prominent Omaha family, uh, Lieutenant Jarvis Offutt. He had been killed while flying for the Royal Air Force over Europe and uh, thought it would be a fitting honor for him to have the new airfield named, named for him. The next exposure to aviation came in, the, in during World War II, when uh, Fort Crook was selected as the site of the Glen Martin Bomber Assembly Plant. And this plant turned out thousands of B-26 and B-29 bombers, including Boxcar and the Enola Gay, which dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And um, after, after, of course, the World War II, uh, the Army Air Corps became the United States Air Force 
and Fort Crook took on a new name at that point, uh, that being off at Air Force Base. And just quickly, I'll, I'll wrap up where the forts are today, what you'll, what you'll find when you see there today and what, what became of them. Fort Atkinson, uh, when, as soon as it was abandoned, the, uh, the, the fort that was there uh, disappeared, uh, disintegrated. Uh, fort Calhoun residents, uh, with a love of history, bought up the land that the fort had been located on, donated it to the state, and in the early uh, 1860s began some, some preliminary ex excavation of the, find, of the site, found original footings. During the 1970s, uh, most of the fort was reconstructed with the exception of the barracks that had been along the riverbank there. But if you go there today, and I especially recommend it during the summertime uh, when they have living history during the, during the weekends, it's the first full weekend of the month, but uh, the Friends of Fort Atkinson uh, recreate the 6th Infantry that was stationed there. Uh, they also have um, bakers and coopers and blacksmiths and tinsmiths and, and laundresses and... Um, they even have church services there on Sunday morning, so you can get an idea of what church services were like in the 1820s. Uh, it's just a fantastic place to be uh, to, to see American history uh, during that period of time. Old Fort Kearney, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the fort buildings that were there became the nucleus of Nebraska City. Uh, there's nothing left, of course, of the original fort today. If you go to the site, on uh, Nebraska City's Main Street, there's a marker for the Oregon Trail, and on the back side of that marker is a plaque which commemorates Fort Kearney, which was built about 50 yards to the south of, uh, of the post. The interesting thing about Kearney, there's always been two ways of spelling it. And you can see on here Fort Kearney with the second E, named for Brigadier General Stephen Kearney, no second E. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, of course, if you go to the city of Kearney today, you'll find it with the second E. If you go to, to the next one, uh, Fort Kearney uh, does not have the second E. When they, dedicated, when they bought up the land and dedicated the site to the state, they did have the second E, but in the historical research found out that Kearney actually did not have a second E. So if you go to the post today, it is Fort Kearney without the second E. And they've reconstructed one of the... Uh, one of the sod adobe uh, buildings. This is the blacksmith shop and have a couple of the um, army wagons there. Um, beautiful little site, uh, right along, of course, very close to the Platte River. Uh, it's also a bird watching <laughs> site during the, uh, the crane migration, that kind of thing. Fort McPherson, before its closing, uh, was established as a national cemetery. And one thing about national cemeteries, they do not go away. Fort McPherson went away, but the, the cemetery lives on. And it's one of the most beautiful sites on the, on the Great Plains today. It's, it's kind of a surprise when you're coming down the road from, um, from the interstate to, to see the site. And it's, this is a drier climate, of course, and so you see more browns and tans. And then you arrive to the, to the National Cemetery site, and it's just a beautiful lush green. Um, very well manicured, of course, very well kept. Uh, and still fairly, fairly busy. They're, they average around uh, two burials a day. At, uh, at Fort McPherson still, which is a, kind of a surprise. Fort Mitchell, uh, I mentioned about <laughs> adobe disintegrating under, under rain and wind and that sort of thing. Fort Mitchell, we, we think it was probably closed in 1867. Uh, they don't have a, the final dispatch that says anything about, about it being closed, but uh, we imagine it disappeared then, and of course nature taking its, its way with the post uh, had it disappearing. Uh, don't know exactly where the site was. They had found some artifacts a few years ago during some highway construction, but they that could just as well have been from the road ranch that was occur, uh, located across the trail from, from Fort Mitchell. But uh, the state does have an historical marker there about two miles from, from um, Scotts Bluff National Monument. Fort Omaha, uh, I mentioned about Omaha businesses not liking to keep uh, uh, installations closed. They succeeded in getting Fort Omaha reactivated. It was a balloon school during World War I. In fact, the largest balloon school in the country, balloons being used for the observation of enemy uh, positions, that sort of thing. Uh, after the war, uh, during World War II, it served as an induction center and as a work camp for Italian prisoners of war. Uh, it became the national headquarters for the Naval Reserve following the war in 1975. The reserve donated most of the land to the Metropolitan Community College. Uh, the original headquarters building is still there, of course, uh, after headquarters was moved back downtown and became the new post hospital. Uh, 
and today serves as the library for the Metropolitan Community College. And General Crook's house is still there, of course. Uh, it's operated as a museum by the Douglas County Historical Society. And as a board member of that group, I encourage your visiting the, <laughs> the Crook House. Uh, the Old Omaha Quartermaster Depot. Uh, I was happy to find out from John Bryant today that it is actually still open for now. It was supposed to have been closed back in November. This has been um, since 1950s, uh, an Army Reserve base. Some kind. Uh, during World War II, it served as a prisoner of war camp for Italian prisoners of war. Um, and you can see the Omaha skyline in the background, give you a rough idea of where it's located, but the buildings are beautifully uh, maintained. Uh, eventually, the Army Reserve uh, companies that are located there are moving to a new, more secure site out by Elkhorn, Nebraska. Uh, security has also always been a concern here, and um, they lost one of the warehouse buildings back in 1975 due to a, a transient that had broke in and I think built a fire to keep warm. Was that right, John? Built a fire on the wood floor. Built a fire on the wood floor and it got plenty warm for him. <laughs> it's one of the biggest fires in recent Omaha histories with that. But uh, John Bryan used to be the uh, site, was it site supervisor for the? Facility manager. Facility manager for the for the Quartermaster Depot and uh, gracious enough to help conduct a tour that I conducted there last October, which I thought was, it's next to last month, but it's still still getting some things wired out at Elkhorn and then, then make the move. Fort Sydney was uh, originally, uh, and it eventually surrounded by the city of Sydney. Uh, there are three buildings left. Um, one of them is, serves as the Cheyenne County Museum. This was one of the officers' quarters. They own the other two buildings as well. One is, uh, as um, oh, kind of gives you an idea, it's also an officer's quarters, but it's, it's furnished in the period that time. And the other one is a uh, powder magazine, kind of a unique octagonal shaped building, uh, which at one point had served as a very, very, very small apartment, <laughs> but is now closed off. And uh, I don't know if they offer that for tours at all, but uh, that's what's left of Fort Sydney. Fort Robinson uh, became, at the end of the Indian Wars, became um, a remount depot. They had up to 12,000 horses here at one point uh, being conditioned for the Army's uses. Uh, and you have that many horses and have that many officers that love horses. They, they eventually have polo games out there and, and fox hunts and the Pine Ridge in the background. It was such a relaxed life that uh, many called it the country club of the Army uh, <laughs> during that period of time. Um, Eventually, after World War II, it got turned, it had served as a German prisoner of war camp. Uh, after World War II, the grounds had been turned over to the Department of Agriculture, which eventually, over time, turned the lands over to the state of Nebraska, which established it as, as Fort Robinson State Park, and just a fantastic place to be. I mean, just for the sheer history that there, the, the events that happened out of there, but the scenery with the Pine Ridge, um, They've got all the activities you'd ever want to do out there with the, with the jeep rides and wagon rides and horseback riding. There's, if you're a geologist of any kind, there's plenty of uh, digs out there for you to take a, take a look at. Uh, archaeologists, just, it's just an amazing part of Nebraska that uh, I always encourage people to visit if they've never been there. Fort Hartsuff, uh, during its time, it was described as one of the prettiest posts on the plains, and it's still that. It's, it's one of the best preserved fort sites on the Great Plains. It's the only post uh, when the buildings were constructed of concrete, and they did that because they had lime and gravel and plenty of water in the North Loop Valley. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it, though. It's about two and a half hours off of the interstate, so it doesn't get a lot of attention. And of course, like other state properties, it's, it's been subject to cutbacks. And so I always encourage people to do visit Fort Hartsuff as well. It's, it's, uh, it's got a kind of a tough road to hoe right now with uh, lack of interstate traffic, but it is just, it's well worth a visit. Just a, just a beautiful, beautiful park. Fort Niobrara, after it was decommissioned, all of the buildings were, were sold off. Uh, there's only one of the original 90 buildings left at the fort site, and that's a, a huge red hay barn that's there. Uh, in 1906, the, um, the grounds for the fort, were, uh, legislation was enacted that helped create it as a national wildlife refuge. Uh, Nebraska rancher had donated um, uh, buffalo and elk from his ranch to the, uh, to the refuge, and this is the, these are the descendants of the original uh, buffalo herd that was there. And, of course, Fort Crook became off at Air Force Base, and this is the original fort site right there. 
officers row in the Listerman's barrack, and as you can see, it's quite a bit larger than what they originally had to deal with, but uh, kind of kind of unique, and this was, you know, for a fort that wasn't needed, that really wasn't essential, it went on to become one of the most essential uh, posts in, in Nebraska, or in, in the military's history. And that concludes the forts of Nebraska. Uh, let's see, did we have time for a few questions? Ten minutes, okay. Uh, but uh, you know, as a native Nebraskan, I, I'm extremely proud in what what has happened with the, with the military in our state. I mean, from having the very first fort on the Great Plains with Fort Atkinson, the very last fort built for the Indian Wars with Fort Crook. I mean, to have personalities like Custer and Buffalo Bill and Crazy Horse uh, come through here, uh, General Crook, of course, President Grant. Uh, just an amazing, amazing amount of history. I mean, to have a role in the very first of the Plains Indian Wars. The ending of World War II with, uh, with the, the bombers built out of Fort Crook, um, the beginning of the Spanish American War, just a tremendous amount of history. And as, as fellow Nebraskans, I hope, I hope you're equally as proud of, of, uh, of the history of this in our state. Thank you very much. Okay. Hey, yes, sir. You mentioned at the beginning the notation that Lewis and Clark made about Council Bluff being mm -hmm. a good site for a fort. What was it about that particular spot that they thought would make a good site for a fort? Well, at the time, uh, the bluff on which they were located was, was very prominent on the Missouri River. Uh, we had a, had a great view both upstream and downstream. But uh, over the course of time, the river is four miles away from the, from the site today. Uh, due to, you know, every time the Missouri flooded, it rechannelized. And of course, uh, since then, the Corps of Engineers established a new permanent channel for the, for the Missouri. So you can't see the river from, from the, the site today. Uh, but at the time, it, it afforded a fantastic view of the, uh, of the river. And, and travelers up there note, noted in their journals for many years to come that when they had spotted the ruins of, of Fort Atkinson passing through there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again very, very much. Uh, again, the gift shop does have copies of the book if you're interested. Um, I did bring along that map that I told you of the much smaller uh, posts along the, along the trail. That covers pretty much all the skirmishes and military posts in Nebraska during the Indian Wars. So, okay. Thank you very much.